of the Ummah Association of Masajid. Easy. Okay. Your brother in Islam. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we're up. Alhamdulillah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani wa-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahmani r-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasuli al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. No way to ta'alam wa ta'alam wa ta'dakra 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 Apologies for all of the long period of waiting, a lot of things going on at Table Foundation, end of year, preparing for the next round of grading, getting books ready, and trying to make sure that we have the opportunity to present to you our next guest for today, Brother Imam Amin Muhammad from Atlantic City, Imam of Masjid Muhammad, and also a member of the Ummah Network, uh, United Masjids. What is the rest of it, Brother Imam? I'm not, I can't remember the acronym. Uh, uh, United Muslims Making American History. United Muslims Making America History, Ummah. So check them out. They do Facebook Lives as well. I've seen some things that they were doing during the month of Ramadan and right after. So keep eyes open for that. Also, we have again with us uh, Brother Staff Tabri Zahir out there in California, Abdul Zahir, excuse me, out there in California. And this last piece that we're going to be working on today is going to be uh, kind of a culmination of everything that we've worked on up until this point, what we've talked about, and it's called uh, Throwing Stones While Living in a Glass House, Our Demands for Justice While We Are Unjust. And I think this is very apt in light of a lot of the things that all of us have seen and heard and experienced over the last few months in terms of how we've been engaging socially and what has been a uh, viewed by some as being a little disruptive, but viewed by others as being not disruptive enough. And within all of that, the Muslim voice has been very fragmented. You know, you see people coming from all ends of the spectrum, making all types of demands or lack of demands and whatever else. So, you know, it's, I think we're gonna have a good conversation today. So inshallah, I'm quite sure Brother Tuberty has something to add to that before we get started. So we'll let him go for it. Alhamdulillah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, was salatu was salamu ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Jazakallah khairan Imam uh, for coming on today. Um, you know, I would just, you know, let our audience know, Alhamdulillah, that uh, Imam Amin Muhammad is one of the Imams who is at the forefront of, you know, uh, helping um, educate, you know, African Americans. The African American community is the largest community in America, the, the largest Muslim community in America. Um, and but what has to happen um, is that, you know, African Americans, um, inshallah, are in the process of producing a class of scholars um, who can address the spiritual condition of, of African Americans. And I consider the work that Imam uh, Amin Muhammad is doing is, is, is absolutely essential. It's absolutely essential. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, as Abdul Muhammad said, this is a program, inshallah, where we're trying to get at the root of how to effect change um, in the society correctly. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma bi qawmin, hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in their very selves. So the question that inshallah we're going to try to get at today is, how do you go about effecting change? First within yourself, in order that it spreads outward. And that it is impossible to effect lasting change without changing yourselves. So inshallah with that, 
بسم الله عبد المحيم الحمد لله uh, yeah that's that's a good point that you made with the ayat and we all should be aware of that in both of the different uh, ways that the ayat was revealed that not just the ayat but that particular phrase was revealed because there's two different ways one was in surah al anfal and the other was in surah al ra'd where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave slightly different uh, revelation in terms of how he was talking about changing the conditions or the blessings of a people. But also we have to remember in terms of keeping with the, a, the theme of what we're talking about, the ayat that's also in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yes. Because and do you command the people with beer, with righteousness, goodness, and you don't practice it yourselves and you are reciting, also you're reciting the book. And as we know, this was revealed in reference to Bani Israel and some of the mystery things that they were doing in the presence of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where they were still in Medina. And although again, we know that it was being directed towards them in particular when the ayah was revealed, as we know, there's the duality with the call and the understanding of how we should receive the message when it's given to us. And we should look at ourselves more so than what we are understanding what the ayat is talking about because again, Muslims have become the object of the concern of the revelation again, because oftentimes my own personal perception of what I've seen, we have some very strange and uh, puzzling things that we choose to project onto the people in terms of demanding justice and things of that nature there, even to the point where what some people call to be the social justice warriors or the activists, uh, individual, people who practice activism within the Muslim community or outside of it, but we have this very, or they have this very staunch and, 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 and boisterous way of demanding things of people but the, the akhlaq and the adab of how these things should go about or how you should be engaging with others is just like totally thrown out of the window. And then again, you know, you have the things about the council culture and all of these other particular aspects. So it's a lot to talk about. It's a lot to talk about. And without further ado, I would like for everyone to hear Imam Muhammad give his particular opening on this particular subject and how he would like to look at addressing this because he is the guest for the day. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أسأل الله تبارك وتعالى أن يجنا أن يجعل نياتنا خالصة لوجهه الكريم I praise and I thank Allah تبارك وتعالى I ask Allah to send countless blessings and salutations on our leader and guide, Sayyiduna Muhammad وسلم, his family, his companions, and all of those who follow them in excellence until, until the day of judgment. And I ask Allah to grant us all the sincere intention. And before, before I uh, start, let me thank uh, Tabor Foundation and Brother Abdul Muhammad and Brother Tabari, and all of your staff, uh, Imam Sheikh Rami, who facilitated this uh, gathering, because you know it is important that we thank people for their efforts, because if we're going to really benefit, we should thank those who make effort, and that is a form of us thanking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam indicated to us, the one who does not thank the people has not thanked Allah. So let us, you know, uh, first by thanking you, we wouldn't have an opportunity to be in this gathering and get the blessings and the barakah and the mercies and everything that is sent in such gatherings if it weren't for you organizing it. So we thank you. In terms of the topic, I want us to look at several things. And as I talked to you before, I like to have frank, real, raw, uncut, unapologetic, non-compromising, 
no shoe shuffling, no tap dancing conversation. So once you invited me, that's what you're getting ready to get, where nothing's off the table, but we're gonna have adept, we're gonna have manners and everything we address. So for our looking at this topic, the oppressor and the oppressed, we're looking at basically three words when we talk about this subject. Number one, the act itself, which is a dhum, right? A dhum, the, the oppression, injustice. That's one, that's what you're talking about. The one who's doing it, al-fa'il, right? That one who is doing it, a volim, the oppressor, the unjust person. And the one who is a recipient of it, al mazlum the one who is oppressed, right? The one who is the victim of what's happening. So when we talk about injustice or oppression and its removal, we need to take in consideration all these terms and then address each of them in the light of the sacred law, in the, in the light of why we're here. Allah wa ta'ala told us in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the jinn and the human were only created to be ordered with the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, to know Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. So everyone on the earth is charged with this responsibility. And that is to know Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. And one knows about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through worshiping Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. So when we think of that, that comes into hukuk that adds another word, which is rights, right? Rights between people. So the first right that we have is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alayna, Allah's right on us, which is what the purpose we're created for, to worship him. With that said, then if we're gonna look at injustice or oppression, we gotta figure out where is that oppression? Is that oppression in its definition of oppression? It is actually, putting place, putting things in other than their proper place. In other words, removing rights from where they belong, engaging in the rights of others in a way that is not proper. That's loom. So you're gonna be looking at three types of rights. The right of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Allah has a right on us. That is why we created to fulfill that right. The right on the servants or the creation because they have rights and the right of ourselves, right? So we have a right. Whenever we talk about womb, we got to figure out what we talking about, what aspect of it, and then tackle that one because womb is a, a wide concept. Oppression is a wide concept. The oppressor can be the servant doing oppression against the commands of Allah. It could be the servant doing oppression against others. It could be the servant doing oppression against himself. So when we're talking about that, we wanna define. So a lot of times when we don't define things, we can't channel in exactly what we're talking about. And then when we talk about the rights, I want to define everything under the sacred law. So in order for something to be uh, unjust or for someone to be an oppressor, that means they're contradicting some aspect 
of the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is found in the objectives of the sacred law because the sacred law is put here to maintain the rights of Allah, the rights of the servants and the rights of the people them on themselves. All of the sacred law defines that. So every action, every speech is going to fall under one of five categories in the sacred law. It is going to be an obligation. It is going to be a recommended matter. It's going to be a permissible matter. It's going to be a dislike matter, or it's going to be an unlawful matter. When we're talking about oppression, we always fall under what? The unlawful matter, right? That means if you're doing something unlawful, that means if you do it, you deserve to be punished. And if you leave it out, you are rewarded. So that means you deserve to be punished for these things. So there's where we're talking about room. Now, when we apply that to whatever situation, we match it with the sacred law. So when I think of Loom, and I'm talking of the title that you mentioned, that throwing stones while living in a glass house. When I think from that, I'm thinking that you're talking about us as Muslims saying we want justice or crying out that is Zoom is being perpetrated against us. So that is the, uh, the rights of others is being violated and we happen to be the others. While at the same time, we are oppressive doing Zoom or others by neglect, negating their rights that are given to them by the sacred of a law, sacred law, which means we're doing something unlawful, that fifth category, when we should be doing the obligation or the recommended matter, and at worst, the, the permissible matter, and if it's, we're really short, at least the minimum of it, the dislike matter. We should not fall into the unlawful matter, nor the dislike matter, but at, at the dislike matter, we're censored there before we go into the unlawful matter, right? So there's many dislike things that will ultimately lead to the unlawful, that will ultimately lead to oppression. So the dislike one is to cut us off from going to the unlawful one, right? So if I am correct, we're talking about Muslims being unjust themselves while seeking justice. Am I correct in that? Yes, alhamdulillah, you hit it right on the head. Or are we talking about other forms of injustice? Or that's the one we're talking about. We're talking about that in specific, but in a broader context, you know, like with all of the series that we've done up to this point, we try to centralize by making sure that we're talking about ourselves first before we're projecting that out on other people. But we're also trying to make sure, being that myself, the staff Tuberty, the vast majority of the table uh, student body, and, you know, like yourself and all of the guests that we've had on are people of color. We also have to talk about what's going on within our communities as well, because a lot of this conversation we're having came out as a direct result of the murder of George Floyd, among other things that okay. happened over, over early spring in the summer. So we're trying to make sure that the context that we're keeping our conversation in not only talks about the oppression that's being uh, brought out against people, but we also have to make sure that we're being conscious of the fact that even though you're oppressed, you can be an oppressor. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can take things too far, you can transgress the limit just because you're upset and angry and, you know, you go and just go too far. You know, like we used to say back in the dog, you kill my dog, I kill your cat and all that kind of stuff we used to say. It's just trying to keep it within the context of helping people to see that there's a much larger uh, game afoot, if you will, in terms of what we're dealing with within society and also within how we need to go about dealing with the problem. Because, you know, it has to be a lot of introspection before there can be some outward manifestation of things on people as well. So, so what I would say, if I look at us as Muslims, I would say our injustice that we're suffering from, that I think before we're effective uh, in removing general injustice in the world, in the society, and if we're speaking about based on the George Floyd thing, I have a concept and I would like to know if you agree with it. It's, it's, it's a concept that I have. 
whatever affects black people in America affects black Muslims in America. That everything exactly that is affecting in terms of oppression, injustice, and these words are synonymous in Arabic, right? Uh, is the same thing, whatever that is happening to black people is exactly happening to black Muslims within uh -huh. Islam. And, 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 and that is an injustice that if we remove from the ranks of Islam, we'll be able to show how to remove it in the society. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said about this nation, Right? You are, this is the nation of Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best nation brought forth from the human race, right? From all of the people. You enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the rest of the ayah. Here, you have two terms that makes us after our belief in Allah, which is a foundation, but two highlighted things. We enjoin al-ma'roof, which is good. And that is everything that is called for by the sacred law. We enjoin that. And we forbid al-munkar, which is everything that is prohibited in the sacred law. It's munkar. So we define what is right and what is wrong. So it's not so broad. Everything that the sacred law, as shariatul islamiyah, says is good, that's ma'roof. We call to it. We enjoin it. Everything that the sacred law says is unlawful, we prohibit it. We prevent it, right? If that's the case, when we look at us, that means we as a nation, al-ummatun muhammadiyah, the nation of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have the ability to change any room anywhere if we follow being the best nation, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about us. Now, but if we don't do that within, so I gave you the base. I want to compare black people in general to black Muslims, I'm talking about in America. And it's around the world. I've traveled all around the world, so it's the same thing. Wherever there are black folk, it is the same uh, concept, just different levels because of the environment. But it's the same. I've seen it all around the world, and I can point it out like I, I know my face. <laughs> I can point it. You have two main things that I would say that are affecting black people today. Racism and classism. Two main things, racism, your color. That is a reality. Classism, your social status. And usually that relates to money and education and all those things. And in both of these aspects, we find room against black people, right? Tell you. So that's general in America, black people facing racism and classism. That is the oppression, the oppressed, that is the room, the oppressed and mezlumun, they are black people. The oppressor of volumun is white supremacy and everything that it, uh, it uh, facilitates because white supremacy has a way of helping others who are non-white but share their ideas to oppress others as well. They, they facilitate that route around the world. So now that's with just black people. Let's move those two concepts to Islam, within Islam. Do we have a racism problem in Islam? Let's just say in America. Anyone who says no is blind and a liar to themselves. We have a racism problem within Muslims, among the ranks of Muslims. Okay, do we have a classism problem? Yes, we do, among Muslims. And I'll point them out. We're going to be, I told you, 
We want to be straightforward because we want to change it. We're not criticizing because what I don't believe in is talking about a problem that you're not trying to solve. That's another haram thing. And that is unlawful riba and unlawful namima, which is haram. So if you're going to talk about something, which you're talking about another, which is riba, even if you write, the only way that that unlawful speech becomes permissible to do is when you're removing an injustice and other means, but that's one of them, right? To remove injustice. So even if you're speaking about someone, that is an exception in the sacred law to speak about someone in a way that they don't like. Because what? You're trying to remove injustice. So you got to be honest, right? And the Prophet ﷺ told us, speak the truth, even if it's bitter. It may hurt to speak the truth. But if you want to change, you got to tell the truth. So we have a racism problem and we have a classism problem in America among Muslims. Okay, the boom, racism, classism, we got that, right? Because what does that do? That starts to infringe on the rights of others, right? Because we said boom is when you infringe or you take the rights of others and do with it with that which, which they don't allow, or you put things in its improper place. So there is boom there. Racism leads to boom. Classism leads to boom. There's not a fair distribution of anything, right? Because that's part. Only those of this race are going to be privileged and those of this class are going to be privileged. So the same thing in Islam, you have uh, the, idea, the idea of a form of white supremacy and a form of those who were empowered by white supremacy. They are a volley moon, unjust, oppressors. Their acts of oppression, racism and classism. The object of their oppression, black folk, black Muslims, they've suffered at the hands of others, right? They have been victims of oppression. I don't know if we're dialoguing, I'm laying out my thoughts. As we dialogue, I'll point to more of my points. So our job as Muslims, you are the best people brought from mankind, right? That means this is a moon card. You're obligated to change it. You see it. Now, I just laid it out in terms of these are the problems. The deep, this is the foundational problems. They have they have details, but foundationally we see it. Black people suffer it. A black man in American society feels no different than a black Muslim in a non-black Islamic environment, right? I'm gonna add one more level to this. In black society, we've seen in America, some black people they make it in that oppressive environment of racism and classism. They get through the cracks and what happens to them, they become like the oppressor. Oppressor. They take on the characteristics of the oppressor through his educational system, through his wealth gap and start to become like the oppressor, right? So he gets a good job gets a good education, and then he start looking down on the other Negroes, right? That happens. We all know that. We call them bourgeois people, right? House Negroes, right? We, I mean, we got the terms for it. Let's go to Islam. The others make an environment, right? They make a standard of what they consider Islamic knowledge. Ship. Some of the Black folk break through that some of them, and they learn, they go overseas, they get degrees, or they sit with shuyuk, they study, and then they come back to America and they become a part of that oppressive system and no longer serve the oppressed, in fact, become a means of stopping the oppressed from getting their freedom. They become just like those who were oppressing the people prior 
to them learning. And I can point it because this conversation, it's a hard conversation, but in these conversations, you're gonna hurt some feelings, but you're gonna change the condition too, right? Uh, so I, I'll, leave, I'll put a pin in it right there because I said a lot and I, don't, I want us to dialogue, which is beneficial. So there's my thought of oppression, oppressor, oppressed. In Islam, outside of Islam, relating to Black Americans. Now we can discuss, I mean, from my point, I'll lay that out, give y'all a chance to respond on that. And then if further need to specifically point to it, I will. Or if the general is clear, then we can talk about the general and how we can solve it. But if we need more specifics, you already know them. I'll just point them out so that no one can run from them. <laughs> well, 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 in terms of giving the summary, what we were talking about, you you summarized a lot of what we went over with the previous five sessions very well. Although, like you said, some of the details, because a lot of the points we've raised ourselves, so we can possibly go back and allow you to elaborate on some of the details because being that you are an imam within the community and you have dealt with the larger African-American community as well as just the larger Muslim community across the country and other places around the world, it's, it's much more relevant for you to be able to share this with people and for them to get, be able to get an understanding of where we were coming from with this. This is one of the reasons I felt it was important to make sure that we had you and allowed you to give your opinion on some of these things so we can have, like you say, the dialogue can spread a little bit. But uh, one of the larger problems that we were dealing with, like you said, is that oftentimes most of the immigrants to this country, and again, like we shared before, we don't try to, like it's not about picking on people, we're just dealing with reality. If we're gonna be honest and we're really talking about, we're gonna get things, we want things to change and look different. We have to really just say what needs to be said. For the most part, all of the civil liberties that are enjoyed by Muslims here within this country, whether it's calling their dan, walking around and being able to wear hijab, uh, beards, poofies, whatever you want to do, full Islamic garb, however you want to go, having certain areas where children are able to uh, pray, eat, uh, being relieved from school, any number of things that you're talking about, praying on the job, all of these things, all of this came as a direct result of the work of African American. Muslims from the early periods up in the 50s, 60s onward, although we know we're not going to get into terms of Aqida and whether or not this group or that group, Nation of Islam, whatever, but there was a group of people who said that they were calling to Allah and Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they put in the work. And the vast majority of these people who did this work, who went after these social and civil rights, particularly within the prison system, you know, I had a young man the other day, he had some questions about some things, he was a little bit upset about some stuff that was going on. like, hey man, you're talking about this system, but you're in the same right that you have to pray, to correspond with us here at table, to do all of these things that you're doing, to study, is because of the work that African-American Muslims did, and they did it through the system. He was talking about the system, but you know, we're getting a little, that's not exactly where we're going with the conversation, but it, it's related. But in terms of the ability to be able to grow, to be able to have this platform and speak as we're doing now, because for the, our immigrant population and the second and third generation, you can't go back home and do what we're doing right now and have the conversation that we're having. It's not gonna happen. You know, I'm not sure if there's any place, but for the vast majority of places that I'm aware of, the Muslim majority countries, you go and have these kind of conversations, somebody's gonna be coming to pick you up two, three o'clock in the morning and they're not gonna see you no more. You know, here, it doesn't happen. And we have to take recognition to the fact that there are shoulders and backs of people that we're standing on. And even outside of what Muslims have done, just African Americans period in terms of civil rights and social rights for individuals within this country, despite the, the trajectory of where things are going these days, you know, it was a direct result of the work that was put in by our people. And for the most part, the recognition that I've seen and I, I have trouble with is the fact that it's very, it's very condescending the recognition that you often hear people give a lot of the things that we have fought for, our ancestors fought and died for. And like we were talking about, you know, in terms of talking about being just and demanding certain things of people, 
but at the same time, just totally disregarding the voice and the, the, the input and the support of the individuals who actually make things possible for you to be fighting at the level that you're fighting now, you know, again, it's, it's very insulting. So we have to find a way to really get down, like you said, sit down and have this conversation because even after the series is over, and just like with the, the issue of uh, George Floyd and after his murder and Breonna Taylor and all the other people earlier this year and before that and after it, the conversations were there. The first two, three months, as we always see, you know, there's a crescendo and then there's an ebb. You know, things just fall off all of a sudden. And then after that, it levels back out and it's business as usual. So my purpose of being here and doing this work is to actually see some, some, some meat, some, some change for real. So now the question is, now that we understand this here, what's the first line of attack that we need to do? For lack of a better word, not talking about we're going out and make enemies of people, but the first line of attack, what do we need to do to start not only have, because we're having the conversation, the conversations have been had. What are we actually going to do to start making some things happen? What, what are some action items that we can get in? But if Tuberty has something he wants to add, you know, for yourself as well. But that, that's my first question. I don't know. We got to, Tuberty, if you, you're, you're going to add in, we got, I have a lot. So I'm just, but I don't want to just. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, it's good. I'm not giving a speech on myself. Right. sharing, right? No, I, what, but I have no, a lot. I have a lot to go. We, it's time that if, to answer that question, we don't have enough time but we can lay a foundation because it's work. And a lot of times what we do, we like to talk, right? But we don't want to do the work that that, the talk, that talk necessitates, right? right. I, I had a discussion with my brother, you know, this politics time. And my brother, he is from our background and, you know, we're, we're soldiers. Right? <laughs> and he, you know, he often, you know, tells me about this system, white system, how unjust it is. And I tell him, I say, you know, there's a reality that we don't want to face. Because we're enjoying in the system ourselves, we're hesitant in really making the real change. The system needs to change, not a part of the system, right? So the same thing we're talking about with Islam, you're going to have to change the system, not a part of it, right? The oppressor loves that he gives the oppressor, the oppressed, enough to satisfy his desires and keep him quiet. But he never changes the injustice. He just gives you a portion to remain silent, right? But you're still in the same condition because it's necessary for him to remain in his position of privilege. You got to upset that whole balance. And that's what I'll talk about uh, after Imam uh, 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 Sayyidi. Uh, Sayyid Tabari. Bismillah. Um, I, I guess I would say, um, Imam, like um, if there has ever been a time to talk about these issues, now is the time. Um, I think more people, there are more people that are ready to do the work from amongst the, amongst the uh, Muslim community. There are more people, especially some of the heads of the major Muslim organizations, um, you know, that they, they want you know, some guidance, they want input. Um, and alhamdulillah, like this is the time. So I, now is not the time to be politically correct. Now is not the time to, you know, take the, fo the foot off the accelerator. Now is the time to say, okay, you want to talk about it? You want to do something about it? You want to hear, you know, what, 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 what the, the oppression from the mouths of those who have experienced it directly? Here it is. That, that's what I would say. So I, I'll share some things. So what, what action items can we do? First of all, if we look at America, the history of Islam in America as we know it, as we know it, why am I saying this? Because if you take, you can take the history of Islam which is the new narrative, to talk about it in a way that excludes us. So you can talk about first people, early Muslims in Americas in the 1800s or 1900s or, be, or before that, 
before black people, black ex descendants of slaves were the ones who Islam was the focal point, right? So you'll talk about, you know, all these other early slaves who wrote, uh, uh, you know, poetry and wrote the Quran and on this, but when it, and you'll highlight that now because these are non black Americans. You'll highlight that. They are slaves, but they're still in the early stages of white supremacy and slavery. And they're irrelevant to the conversation. Really irrelevant. Doesn't make nice history, doesn't mean anything. But you use that to say they were real Sunnis, real Muslims. Uh oh, I'm gone. What happened? We, we, we still hear you, Imam. We still see you and hear you. I don't see me, nothing. What happened? Uh oh. I got totally <laughs> blacked out. It's on your end because we see you, we hear you. No, How did it you happen? Is your battery, the, the battery dying on the, on the, no, on the no, computer? No, 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 no. Yeah. Zoom. Yeah, what you're still you showing on Facebook and you're showing here on my screen as well. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know. Yeah. My whole everything went out. I mean, so I'm hear? there, but I don't know. You hear us, but you can't see us. I can't see anything. Yeah, everything's good on this end. Your picture's still so clear and all. But I can't work no more. I, I don't. I don't have anything to press. Anything. I'm sorry. I. I, I don't know what happened. If. Uh, uh, oh, maybe this. No, maybe this. I don't know what happened. I can't see anything. If you can hear us, go ahead. We, everything, the picture, everything's still clear. Okay, I'll keep talking. Okay, I'll keep talking. But how I'm going to pause? Okay, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> anyway, uh, where was I at? I'm sorry, this thing just went boom. Start right. talking about black you, stuff. You were, you, were talking about, <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about the irrelevance of you know okay. using. Right. Uh, and when, when I say irrelevant, I don't mean that it's not important. I mean, in terms of our on the ground reality, it's irrelevant. Right, right, right. Uh, so you'll say this is the real Islam, which entails that anything that the blacks of America that change the form of challenging racism and everything in this country under the name of Islam is considered as a deviation and irrelevant and, and not accepted. And then the new Islamic movement, which doesn't relate to them, becomes at the forefront. And that is considered something that is, you know, a deviation. And it's taken out of the equation. And it gives a new version of how to interact with an oppressive society, if you understand what I mean by that. Absolutely. Okay, so the conversation, now, now look at the circles of Black, black Islam, you know, when they talk about the black struggle of Islam or the black struggle in America or Islam from others, whether they're white Muslims or immigrant Muslims, because I'm not giving the white Muslims a pass. They don't get one, right? right. They are just as guilty and the immigrants learned it from them, mm. right? Mm. That's why when you talk about uh, leadership in Islamic America, you see the face of white people and, and immigrants, and then a few token black voices that have no real substance. They're not running the show. They're a part of the show. When we talk right. about Islam in the black struggle, black Muslims, even if they were deviant, who thought they were Muslims I'm talking about, even if they didn't have the correct Sunni creed, they were running the show. Do you notice now you went from running the show to being in the show and the directors are other than you. Right. And the, the show does not include you or your people. 
if you understand my yeah uh, absolutely. remember i can't see what's right. going on here so <laughs> <laughs> right. i don't know if, if you're understanding what i'm saying no we're, 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 we're with you so let me give you an example of that if you name the main organizations in america islamic so-called sunni islamic organizations right you're going to name the big three right right and the big three everybody who's in islamic america knows among those big three that have become you're going to have ikna isna and now in the sunni community zaytuna right 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 who runs all of them Right, it's, as you said before, they either right. either, either um, foreigners or the, um, the 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 white converts. Right, but as uh, Abdul Muhammad mentioned, who laid the foundations of who laid the foundations of Islam as we know it, as white America know it, were black folk. Where is the black leadership in any of those organizations as influential leadership that affects the change in the society? Where is it? Now I've been around for 40 years. So even when they had black leadership, black leadership wasn't making the call. I can have a real conversation because I'm, I'm an imam. So I know what goes on. So right. if we're going to change that, we're going to have to say, okay, where is black leadership? Now, I'm going to show you something. Those early groups, even so-called Sunni, because my definition of Sunni is a whole nother discussion, which relates to white supremacy, right? This is going to go worldwide if I talk about this issue. Sunni Islam as it has become dominant to us, is not Sunni Islam. Listen to what I said. In our communities, Black America, what is known as Sunni Islam doctrine and practice is not Sunni Islam. Right. But what has been given in suburban America, in white America, as Sunni Islam that has become official is Sunni Islam through scholarship. Okay. I need you to follow me here. Yeah, yeah. The Islam you. that is in the black community that has been allowed to grow, that has not served us for the last 40 or 50 years, right? Is an Islam that was developed by white supremacists mm. in the Gulf of Saudi Arabia. Okay. I'm just, I want you to follow me. Yeah. Imam, I, I want to I ask you a question. Okay. Um, just, I, I just want to back up just a little bit to flush out something here. Okay. All right? Go ahead. Um, the first thing is, uh, you know, the, 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 I would say the first thing is, do African Americans, if you go back, Oh, are, are you back? You see everything? Yeah, now? I found it. I'll do that. All right. Webex <laughs> threw a Zoom through a screen on me and blocked the screen. I didn't see that. Oh, okay. Bismillah. Okay, so. Hold on um, one second. Go ahead. I hear you. Okay. So, um, if we, like you said, if we go back 40 or 50 years, and, you know, right at the time when the different, uh, you know, you know, immigrant based organizations were being developed. Um, they were starting to, you know, they were much more, they were well funded. Um, as you know, as we know, this happened, you know, because of classism, uh, because of racism. Um, and you, what you're saying right now is that there should, and, and I, I totally agree with you. But what I'm, I'm questioning in my mind is if, if you go back 40 or 50 years, um, did African-Americans have the scholarship 
that was available to the immigrant communities that we are beginning to see in African-American communities now. In other words, did, would have, would, for example, would it have just been tokenism? Would it have been tokenism 40 or 50 years ago if the immigrant population just said, we need more black faces? And they, and they, they allowed black imams to the forefront but a lot of those black imams were not necessarily scholars or even students of knowledge even. And I'm saying that based upon um, a, a, an article that I read, I believe it was in at, at, um, the, the, the Atlantic Journal, um, the um, Atlanta Journal, Atlanta Constitution Journal, something to that effect. Um, and it was an interview with Imam Waritheddin Muhammad. Well, and I was surprised there. to find this. I was surprised to find this, but this is what he said. He said that he had over a thousand imams under his leadership mm -hmm. and more than 80% of them refused to put the educational uh, agenda forward as he um, had directed them. In other words, you know, he was starting to send people to learn, sending them overseas, Ashar, Syria, different places like that. But a lot of the imams that were under him had refused to implement it the way he was trying to get it implemented. So if that's the case, if that's what's happening, is, would, you know, it, would the foreign community, if they had put imams forward and they had put black leaders forward or, you know, black Sunni Muslims forward, um, would it have been more like tokenism instead of genuine, um, um, genuine, uh, 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 you know, people who could represent the tradition and, and actually, um, you know, lead the way. I, you know, that's the, the gist of what I'm trying to say. I, 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 would, I would say, let's go. The answer is two things. One part of that is a solution. The solution is Imam Wurathi Muhammad, rahimahullah, he had it right. I'm not talking about the knowledge part. There were some things that needed to be developed, and he was trying to do that. But one thing he did realize that we as a people needed to maintain our independence from anyone else. That's why that scholarship, quote unquote, and that's a very loose term, right? But that's a whole nother episode in discussion, right? Uh, that scholarship wasn't funded. He did it himself. And I know those imams, some of them, they are my friends, who he sent to study in Syria, but they didn't have the funding like those who were sent to Saudi Arabia, for instance. Why? Because those who sent to Saudi Arabia basically were sent there to do a bidding when they came back. So that was facilitated. Whereas those who went another route, which Imam Wurafi Muhammad, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, was trying to do was to come back and serve black people and they ain't getting the same result. I want you, you gotta understand this world picture. So if you look at those who studied in Saudi Arabia, right? And you look at those from Worthy Muhammad's community, Rahimahullah, who studied in Syria, right? If you look at the level of studies that which is available for those who studied in Syria and those who studied in Saudi Arabia, there's no comparison if you know about Islamic scholarship. However, one is funded and one is not funded. One is funded for an agenda and one is learning for a purpose. Right. right. Right? So I want you to understand these two concepts. It's very important because it's going to help us go forward. We have to stop, and you're going to, this is going to hurt some. We have to stop integrating. We need to segregate in order to cooperate. Mm. Did you hear what I said? I understand. We have tried the integration model. It doesn't work. It didn't work for us. 
in, in, in regular society still hasn't. And it ain't working with us from the Islamic point because at the heads of what is called Islam is controlled by white supremacy. See, they went this way. White supremacy used to take us head on. They figured out how to nullify us in religion is to take us on through their friends and allies. So they go overseas, they change the curriculum overseas, they help infiltrate Islam in, then they send that Islam black in the Islamic community and that in the Islamic community never serves us. Do you understand my point? So it's still the same hand, it's just hidden, not me, Y'all going overseas, y'all studying. But who's controlling the policy of those people who are teaching you? White supremacists, America, right? And then they give you an official doctrine and in the prisons, I know this well, right? In the prisons, uh, when we in the prisons, let's go, let's, I'm gonna show you this. Who runs Islam in the prisons? What people? Question. Salafis. Salafis. I, I didn't hear your question. Wahhabi Salafis and no, 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 no. I'm talking about ethnicity. Who runs oh, the prison? African Americans. African Americans. So who was the voice of Islam in American society in an era in the last 50, 60, 70 years that we know? What was the voice prior to immigration? What was the voice of so Islam in America? Black people, right? We still see that in the prison, right? Do you see blacks in the prison following immigrants or white people? No, you don't see that. Very rarely. And, and, and if you see it, it is black folks who have become oppressed again inside of Islam. And this is gonna sound racist, but it's not. It's how you solve a racist problem, right? So. In order, so long as you integrate, you integrate and this is a way for them to subjugate. Because integration is only works when everyone's at an equal playing field, you're not. So when you integrate, then they can say, oh, you don't got no scholars. You're not learning enough. Now you must be under me. And until you learn if you don't learn independently, I'm going to indoctrinate you to serve me. But you don't think like that, right? So that's what happens. So here's my thing. In order, and Imam Wafti, I said Imam Wafti Muhammad, he understood this concept. That's why of all the misaji in America, his misaji that was under his leadership to this day, have remained controlled by African Americans, right? Now, and then some of them have learned. We're gonna talk about us too. They have learned. So when they learned, now there is a process, right? But if I look at all of those organizations, I'm going, and, and, and uh, Sheikh Romney knows me, so he will understand <laughs> how I come, right? Look at Ikna, look at Isna, look at Zaytuna. Some of you are in California. These are national organizations. How much of their effort is put in the black community in terms of knowledge, education, and teaching? I'm an, I, I've been all around the country and I could answer that quickly, but I'm just asking y'all as a, we're having a conversation because you're on the ground. You know black Muslims, black massage in your areas. Right. How much of education is put in those black communities? There, 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 there. I can talk about that I'm aware of. Huh? Here in Georgia, within this region, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, this particular region, I can't speak of none that I'm aware of. Uh, Tuberty? Yeah, I mean, um, I've, you know, because I'm in California, I, I have seen, um, I've seen some outreach, 
but I understand your point. Your point uh, is, you know, as a national organization and the level of influence that they have, um, you know, the, 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 the outreach to the, you know, African-Americans, it should be more. I, I understand what you're saying. No, 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 no. Sorry, Tabari. We can't, we can't buy that. <laughs> I love you, brother, but I told you we're having a real talk. I'm not talking about outreach. I was specific. How okay. much of Islamic knowledge, knowledge, therefore scholarship in terms of books, in terms of teachers, in terms of scholarships has been for learning. We ain't talking about book bags on Thanksgiving and turkeys that you use to take pictures in the black neighborhood to fundraise for your organization and say we helping, but really at the end of the day, you're doing minimal and getting maximum. We're not playing those games. Okay. I'm talking about education. Give me initiatives, true real initiatives in, 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 in California from north to south, east to west in the state of California, in the black community, in education, in scholarship that's at the disposal of these organizations we're putting the black massage in. Education specifically, because you raised the issue of scholarship. Right. So let's talk about scholarship. Right. Go count all of the black massage that are that are led by black imams that are pre predominantly black and tell me how much effort of education was put there. Because yeah. education is power, right? Right, right. Let's think about it. I mean, you really got to really examine and go around the massage. And if you look at the famous, the famous massage among African Americans, that will let you know, all you got to do is go look there. And then you can look at the other ones who are struggling mass it, which are the majority of them, and you can see the problem, right? So right. if you take famous massage, right, that are known by black leadership and they're popular in California, and then go look at how much scholarship efforts and, and engagement for knowledge is put in that community from others in yeah, a you're right. It's, it's little to none. It's, you're right. right. You're absolutely right. And, and we said injustice is talking about rights, right? Right. Don't everyone have the right to have a solid in education in Islam? Absolutely. Even the Blacks? So whoever's uh -huh. not providing that and has the ability to do it is unjust and is an oppressor. And the greatest oppression is al-jahl. It's ignorance. Al-jahlu bid-deen. Ignorance of the religion. If you have the means to facilitate the education of another and you don't do it, you sinful. That's voom. And you can't get away from that. They say, no, we have classes, yeah, but they're available not for them. Let me give you one of the things that white Americans started. White Americans, Muslim, white Americans, they started buying scholars and making it not feasible for blacks to afford to learn. They have these retreats that cost so much money that puts it out of the possibility of blacks ever attending. Uh, we talking, Yeah. We're having a real talk. We wanna change yeah. the problem. I'm not accusing you, you're unjust. The prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, when you see in my nation, someone afraid to say to a volum, and to volume, you are unjust, then no, all good has left them. Mm. Right? right? Okay. Even if it's yourself. So if you're telling me a retreat, we're bringing scholars. So we're taking care of those scholars. They're not coming for free. I mean, we're doing something. We're pushing their agendas. Even if you don't give them money, uh, you, I'm the wrong one to get started with this stuff because I've seen <laughs> it firsthand, right? right. I'm one of those Negroes who broke through. Have conversation about. Huh? Again, this is part of what we need to have the conversation about because being that table is an educational institution, this is one of the things that we're trying to in, encourage and emphasize with people is the importance of actually being able to have access to sound Islamic knowledge, okay? And even in regards to like what you and Tabari were just talking about, uh, Part of what I wanted to interject in that and ask a question is like, 
what's surrounding all of these issues, like what uh, Staff Tuberty was talking about in terms of would the perception be like one of like tokenism if at that particular time when these things were being established to have put these voices and faces in place and not really give the support and encouragement to help things grow like it needed to be, to flourish. And just like you're sharing right now with how the institution, now that they are in positions of, you could say power within the Muslim community, because with all of them, these are million dollar organizations. You know, they handle millions of dollars every year and they're in their conferences and workshops and things that they're doing around the country. So again, what are you doing in order to assist with the situation that the African-American community in particular is dealing with? Because like you said, yes, they too has graduated some African-Americans and they've had a number of students over the years, but at the same time, the cost benefit and all of this that goes into it for someone such as myself to be able to stop and say, well, okay, I want to go do my four years as they tune and get my bachelor's or do the master's program or I want to go and do this. I want to go do that and study. You know, it's, it's like you say, it's very difficult. Even like to go to the retreat, that, to go to the conference that they do in Canada, the RAS conference. I've heard that there are a lot of expenses that are associated with that in terms of just going there and participating and just benefiting from it at a general level. So but yes, that, here's my thing though, right? If we're going to have a real discussion, we right. can't let that fly. I want to ask you a question. How many black graduates that have graduated from Zaytuna? Tell me. Black, African American. How many? I think it was about five or six that I'm aware of. Five or six. Where are they at right now? We, we're talking about removing injustice. We're dealing I'm, with some slick people. We got to watch who we're dealing with. Only like one Malcolm used to say, you got the wolf and the fox. Both of them yep. going to eat you. Right? So <laughs> let's be careful here. You said five graduates. Only Where one are they? I'm doing anything on a national level is Sister Fatima. OK. And I love Sister Fatima. This ain't personal. It has nothing to do with that. Right? Where is she at? Is she in the black community? I'm not sure what she's doing within the act. OK, you her. Right? Um, Give me another one. In terms of who graduated and what they're yes, doing. Yes, because they, they are an example of education and excellence. And they served, they learned. Now, where are they at in regards to changing the condition of the Black Muslim American? That's the question. Were they taught that? That's the question. Right. Remember we said, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, um, just, just, you know, to give him a shout out, uh, you know, Brother Tariq, uh, he's from uh, Isla LA, Imam Jihad's community. He did graduate and, uh, from, from Zaytuna. Um, but, you know, I kind of know the inside story and it's basically, uh, you know, Imam Jihad, uh, you know, pushed that and, 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 and cultivated it and, and, you know, was like, you got to come back and, and, and help us. And alhamdulillah, he's doing that now. Uh, but I totally understand your point. I totally understand your point um, that, uh, that, that, yeah, you know, the, the initiative. Um, Can I ask you something? Yeah. And, and see, here's what, and I would have this conversation with those graduates. I would have this conversation with the faculty, the faculty at Zaytuna. I would, I, I would have, the, I wouldn't be afraid to have this conversation. Why? Because it's not a criticism of you to put you down. It's to change the condition. Because you may have in yourself, if I just give you husnul dhan, which we should give everybody, right? Everyone, or more than we give a good opinion, right? If you are in a state of a taqsir, you're falling short in this area. I'm not saying you're not doing other good stuff. In this area, there's lacking. Okay. So uh, this, what you could do to improve that, right? Right. You could, you could have... And, and an element of improve, imp improving this. See, I know some, I'm behind the scenes, so you're not gonna be able to, right? I, you know, right. they say, who said at the door? Right, right. Right here, right? Okay. So you, right. I can't, we can't, and, and believe me, because I was on my way to becoming like that, 
until I realized that, wait a minute, they're going to forget us, right? Mm -hmm. I've been offered those big salaries. I've got those big uh, honorariums. I've done it. I understand. I know it works. And I said to myself, you can't really sell out and you don't notice it. You, you're being bought. You getting ready to betray your people. And that definitely ain't my intention. But the system, the way it's set up, that's what it's designed for. That's what's going to happen. You're going to betray your people. And I'm not the only one. I've seen it firsthand. There's, mm. there's a handful of quote unquote scholarly black people. And those scholarly black people are used by the oppressor for purposes. If that person as an individual is not going to stand against that, and it comes back to us, we're gonna have that conversation too. That person, nine times out of 10, may have a good intention towards us, but financial problems step in, that's classism, and they succumb to the money issue. Mm. You know my point? Yeah. I want to do something, but I got to eat. Right. And the, the, the oppressor knows I'm going to give you enough so that you eat, but you always need me. Yeah, got to come back. I'm never going to make you free. Right? You're always, you're going to eat. You're going to eat. Your people are going to continue to starve. And until we realize that, that's why I work explicitly in the black community. I won't do it. I visit others and I love, man, I have a lot of students, I have a lot of well-wishers and I have friends on the scholarly national level, white, immigrant, but they know me. Nah, 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 we gotta do the black thing, bro. We have to, because we're gonna be extinct if we don't. And they're perfectly fine with that, which is sad. That's boom. They're perfectly fine with saying there's no scholarship in the black community. To that point, let me interject. We have a question from Facebook, but it's in line with what we're talking about here. And before I read it, I just want to remind others, because I'm not sure if the individual who sent this question has followed us throughout the whole series and what we were talking about. One of the things that I want people to always remember in terms of whenever you see myself or Steph Fubbery, Iman Amin, I've been watching his work for a while. I, can, I think I can speak with enough confidence to say this for him, is that if we're talking about these issues, it's not because we have some type of uh, hatred or animosity towards people for what may or may not be actually happening, what may be perceived as being happening, what is actually happening. But the thing is, we're dealing with a problem that for most of us, who are living through this type of oppression is something that's very difficult for other people to really understand and, and, and take in as to what it is we're talking about, you know? So we have to be careful when a person is expressing their displeasure with something that is affecting them. And oftentimes if we're the person who the displeasure is, can be seen or is actually directed against, we get defensive. So we become kind of like, uh, I won't say arrogant, but we become, we get ourselves in a state where it's very difficult to actually understand what the person is trying to tell you. You know, that's like the spouse or the child has an issue with the parent or the spouse and it's like they're expressing their displeasure about something. And because you're in that position where you, you're the one who actually initiated the action against them, you don't really want to hear what they got to say. It's like, you put up the shield and the words may come out. You may let them speak, but you're not really giving much uh, value to what's being spoken. So we want to make sure that as we're going through this conversation, it's not to ostracize anybody, but we're giving some information that each one of us have experienced at some level or another. So we want just to make sure to clarify that. So the question, the first question that we had in line with what we were talking about is hey, the end of the Abdul Muhammad, that's yeah. to get you to apologize. Don't apologize. <laughs> Tell the other, listen, I need you to listen to what's going on. I'm going to point it out and you help change it. 
Go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? And that's good because that's part of what they're asking within the question as well. So I'm, I'm glad that they said it. And as a note, this question came, it was it's being noted that it was a question from a white convert. So I wanted to make sure that we addressed that before we actually got to the question itself. So the question says, I think we have to be careful not to divide. If white Muslims are not being just in their treatment of black Muslims, it needs to be addressed and dealt with. But speaking just among black Muslims about the problem, how does this help? Now, just to speak to that before we go further with the questions a little bit more, the platform that we're working with, with Table here, we have supporters from all spectrums of the Muslim community, okay? So it's not just black Muslims. There are a number of African-American Muslims that do work for Table, but there are also Arab Muslims. There are also uh, convert. We have white Muslims. So there, there's a mixture here. So it's not just a group of black Muslims who are just talking about these things. Sheikh Rami's mother, is a white convert. His father was from Jordan. So, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a, 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 is a very broad mixture that we're dealing with here. And all of us have the same uh, outlook on terms of dealing with oppression. So just to put that out, we're not just dealing with black Muslims on this platform. So don't we all need to be involved in the discussion to change it? Absolutely. Now there's another one. Uh, can, I, can I address that yeah. one? Yes. Yeah, let me address that one just quickly, that first question. Uh, the one who sits from a position of uh, privilege doesn't have the right to tell the oppressed how to express their oppression. Right? This is what I mean. Even if you don't realize you sit in a position of privilege, that doesn't mean that you don't, that means you don't realize it, right? So when I'm saying to uh, the idea of only time you can all come together and solve a problem is when you're all equal. Let's go, I'm gonna give you an example. Let's take it away from this. If we all have a business, all of us are going into business, me, you, and Tabari. If y'all got, we need $1,000 to start our business. Y'all got uh, $450 a piece, and I got $100. Is that a fair investment together, all together? Is that an equal investment? No. If y'all not super just, and over just, what are y'all going to say to me when it comes to we make profits? You, 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 you're, not get, you're not getting all of it. You're not getting all of it. You know what I mean? You're not, you know right? what I mean? We that get more. Point. So therefore, if we make $10,000, right? Right? Y'all put up 900. I put up 100. And we make 10,000, right? What's going to happen to y'all and what's going to happen to me? We're going to get the majority. You're going to get your $1,000 and we're going to split $9,000. Right. Now, listen, if we continue in that process, what's going to happen with y'all and what's going to happen with me? You're going to become the You stay where you started. Huh? You stay where you started. Exactly. The only way that can change is either I go do something else that empowers me to come back to you as an equal investor, or you say, you know what? That's our brother. Even though we only had this, we're gonna make sure every profit is equally spent so that we all can develop. Now that I've become empowered, and after a time, I'm gonna be on equal footing or a footing that allows me to be at an ability to say, listen, I got just as much in this as everybody else, even if I initially didn't start with everything equal. You follow my point? So that's what have to happens. Either we break off and build our own so that we become uh, a, a viable force in a discussion or the others, make us equal in the discussion. 
that's in the business. I gave you the same example, right? And so, so my point is, they haven't made us equal in the discussion. That's obvious because we're still in the same position. So the only thing is that we build up and guess what will happen immediately when we start doing our own thing? Not against you. We're just building our bank to come work with you. You realize that you no longer have us as servants and you'll start dealing with us differently. That's what Imam Wafti Muhammad did. He just died and didn't get to finish. He was on his way. He was on his way to, to do that. So I'm just, so it's not, we're not saying get away because I'm against you. I need to be even. And if I stay in this position, I'm gonna never be even unless you let me be even. And since you're not gonna let me be even, that's what I need to do. Do you follow my point? So when yes. I say, I give example, I say to myself, and in my community and my students, we don't need nobody else, right? What do you mean we don't need nobody else? We don't need nobody to talk for us. We don't need to go get fatwas from nobody. We don't need nobody to fund us. We could do it ourselves, right? The books of the scholars, the chains of narration, we have it. We don't need no one to give us anything. We got it. Listen to my point. So now the discussion changes. I don't got to come to you to see the shake. I don't have to. We have our own teachers. We have our own connections. So you can't use that, oh, you know, the shake is in America, but he just makes one token visit to the black community and the rest of the time he's in the suburbs. The shake is coming to do da'wah. Where is da'wah most needed? Now, this is true stuff. Yeah, right. And so, so that's the, what I mean by that. It's not that you want to divide. That's haram. We don't want to divide from anyone. But we want to empower a people so that it can be treated as equals. Or the other way is you can treat your brother and build him. Do you notice what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said? And I, I kind of want to go to that question. You notice what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did to take away racism. He took the lowest of people and made them leaders. Right? And made the Arabs who were oppressive follow the leadership of those oppressed people. They're leaders now. And that was one of the complaints of the leaders of Quraysh, those mushrikun among them. They was like, they're taking our slaves and making them noble. That's what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is doing. Well, that's his sunnah. Why are we not doing that? Right. That's what he did. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, so the sister who asked the question is she back when she did on Facebook, she asked on originally within the chat. So I'm gonna speak to her. Sister Aliyah, in terms of what you're talking about and what we're seeing right now, there are, ex there are exceptions to the rule. And we're not saying that all white converts or all people who are children of immigrants or who are immigrants act this way. But there's a problem that a lot of African Americans have had to deal with over the years that's very uh, is very is very dominant within the within the society that we're dealing with as Muslims or whether it's within the larger American society. So I don't want you to feel like we're just picking on you or all white uh, converts or immigrants cross board. That's not what we're talking about. We're only talking about the individuals who actually engage in this type of behavior. Okay. And in terms of your question about empowerment, yes, it's trying to empower people while changing the situation at the same time. Because part of the problem is changing the situation can only come about as a result of giving people the power or empowering you to be self-sufficient and to be able to stand on their own feet. Okay. And like going back to our earlier conversation in terms of what we were talking about with the email was talking about with integration. Okay. One of the things I always do, because I work with reentry as well, with the Tabor Foundation, and also I work with here in the city of Savannah uh, with the reentry that we have with the ministry that we're doing here in the city. And one of the things I always try to reinforce with people is that we don't nearly be integrated into anything, because that was one of the bigger problems that we had in the earlier part of the civil rights struggle that we went through, where we tried to integrate ourselves into society opposed to changing the conditions that we were living in. 
Now, one of the bigger problems that we have not really addressed is the actual inclusion opposed to integration of African-Americans, whether it's within the American society or within the larger Muslim community as a whole. It's not that, okay, yeah, I can come in and you know, there's a majlis going on and I'm allowed to attend, but my inclusion has to be much more than just allow me to come into the door and sit down and listen, okay? Because like the email was talking about, there are actually African-Americans who have studied and have done a lot of studying over the years. And no matching emails found in Gmail. Y'all have to excuse technology. They're all in people's business now. You know how they go. But uh, so hold on, say I don't have it. Uh, so you know, with the inclusion point, you have to make sure that in being invited into these spaces, that not only is my presence accepted, but my voice and my opinion and everything else about me is accepted as well. And that's a very hard thing to get people to accept. You know, it's enough to let me come to the house for iftar, you know, but you won't come to mine and you won't eat my food. You know, that's, that's, that's a bigger thing, okay? You invite me and okay, yes, we'll have the brother over, we have the sister over, but then at the end of the day, my invitations or my uh, 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 desire to be more accommodating to you as you were to me is not, it's not accepted. There's a problem there, it's hesitation. And, for that point, that's where the inclusion part, just like with what Rasulullah did with the uh, slaves and the poor people among the Muhajireen and the Ansar, when he elevated them and he lifted them up to these positions of leadership. And also another thing that a lot of us really don't grasp in terms of what he did with the, the bonding of the Muhajireen and the Ansar when they came there, because they would have people who had way more than them. A man would have two, three wives and he would divorce a wife just so his brother could have one. Or well, he would give away half his wealth so his brother could have what he left behind. And there was absolutely no malice or anything about that. And everything that was done was in terms of actually continuing to push this person forward and elevating them, lifting them up to be better than what they were, you know, as a result of when your relationship started with them. And that's what we're trying to get at here with these discussions. And again, we know that being this is the last part of the series, the discussion is going to have to carry on. You know, we're getting close to the shutdown, but we're going to add a little bit more time because I think there's a few more things that need to be addressed. If some of y'all have to go to recording, will always be there. But that's one of the bigger things that we need to remember. This is about not just only addressing the situation, but changing it as well. Because it's not enough just to talk about injustice or say this is wrong and I don't like it. What are we going to do about it? And how are we going to get it done? Let me, let me. I want you to pay attention to something mm -hmm. because this is like a circular conversation that we've been having in the black community, right? Over and over again. One of the most unique things that I found, our Imam who's, who's known among everybody, Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Malcolm X. Malcolm X in the white and immigrant Muslim American community, right, is the most celebrated black individual. He's not the most accomplished, he's just the most celebrated. Because if you wanna talk about accomplishments, among the most accomplished leaders in Sunni Islam would be Imam Wafti Muhammad, hand down, hands down. I'm talking about an empowering a people and having an actual ground effect, not just talk in theory, a real change in the condition of African-American Muslims. You got to give it to them. You cannot, no one can speak on his level unless you just are not observing. That's just true. In every aspect, in terms of education, secular education, Islamic education, economics, business develop, development, family, he was working. You cannot, schools, they are the only example of holistic approach to trying to be successful that we got. I mean, if and, and guess what? That has been trying to dumb down their knowledge and that's the way of saying, oh, they ain't, they ain't did, no, 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 no. In time, keep helping and building, what would that be? 
what would the Sister Clara Muhammad schools look like if we, I'm not talking about no one else, supported them? Just black folk, right? Black American Muslims, what would they look like? If we put our money behind those schools as he was trying to change, we brought our scholarship, we worked with him, we cooperated with them, right? Because the same thing that we would accuse them of exists in the other communities, right? The same thing. Here, here's a point that I want to make about uh, Al Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, so, so everyone will know what we're talking about. Do you know Malcolm X died broke? Brother, you your mic went out, I think. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? No, I, 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 can, I, can, I can hear you. That's on your side of the mind. Malcolm X died broke. Do you realize that? Oh, that's on me. That's my speaker. Yeah. I need to reconnect my speaker. Y'all go ahead. Sorry. Malcolm X died broke. He wrote that. He couldn't even travel, right? At the same time, right? Malcolm X died and there wasn't a real long continuation of his movement. But at the same time, 10 years later, Imam Wafti Muhammad, Rahimullah, made a mass transition of hundreds of thousands of Black American Muslims to the Sunnah and have built continuously to this living day right now, right? That's, but that's, and that was all non-funded African-American effort, right? So for us, we got to have to say, listen, we got to support our own if you're not going to do it. If you're not going to do it sincerely for the sake of Allah and say, I want to lift my brother like the Prophet Sallallahu did with the poor in his time, then we have no choice except to do it ourselves. And if we don't do it, we're going to stay in the same position because even if you, right, as an individual are different, the system is the same. So when we talk about white supremacy, go back to black people, there are many good white people, right? We know that. I'm talking about that are not Muslim. I'm talking about that. They they stood on the civil rights lines and they will they they are doing uh, uh, the the me to uh, the Black Lives Movement they out, but when they finish they go back to their suburban neighborhoods and we go back to the ghetto, right? They after they did all their college education they go back to their good job and we go back to figuring out how we gonna eat. At the end of the day, your marching is not translating into transformation of a community. The condition is still the same. And I can speak of it just from my city. So I'm not a Muslim who's outside. I'm on the ground with the people in the things. And every march that they had has not come to directly change the situation of the majority of African Americans while you as one or two or three immigrant or white people are engaging you haven't challenged the system that made you privileged in same way in islam you haven't challenged that system so at the end of the day you are one two three a handful of individuals who want to see change but the system that you're privileged to be a part of has not changed you got to change the system and that to change the system, you got to call it as it is. I'll give you an example. Tell me if you don't know the story. Y'all, have you been to Atlantic City before? Abdul Mohammed? I've, I've been there a few times, but uh, nothing extensive, just kind of okay. passing through. So you're not like Atlantic City residents, so you really don't know what's going on in Atlantic City. I'm going to tell you Atlantic City. And, and now you're in California, you're in Georgia. I'm going to tell you Atlantic City. And you tell me if you can identify this. Atlantic City, the first masjid in Atlantic City was Masjid Muhammad, which I'm the imam of. The masjid is 65 years old, right? We were, before the transition under the leadership of Wafti Muhammad, Rahimullah, my community was number 10 in the nation of Islam. 
The 10th mosque in the nation of Islam is Atlantic City. Mesh, mosque number 10. That was the first. After the trans transition, we went through the le leadership of Imam Wafti Muhammad. And then when our previous Imam Kairi, he started bringing more knowledge, more learning to the Sunnah. When I came back from my last trip overseas, when I became the Imam, we became Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah fully. There's a transition. So we're in the third resurrection. I don't know, right? <laughs> like, but now is a straight Sunni traditional books that you could go to any institution in anywhere in America, in the suburbs, and you could take the curriculum they learn and you will find in our community a curriculum that will challenge that. From books, from language, from whatever you want to talk about, you'll see in the black community a system of learning that can challenge that. It's just we're underfunded. That's it. Uh, to that point there, Brother Iman, we have a question that speaks to that. And it was actually about what you were talking about just a little while ago. So they were asking uh, Imam Muhammad, is there enough qualified African American shiuch and ulama at the moment to teach in African and Black American Muslim communities, or is or is it that the ones who are qualified choose to do it elsewhere for monetary or career or self promotion reasons? Is also the khair for asking. The first one, yes, there are more than enough teachers that are qualified to teach at various levels. Way more than enough. The second, so that's answer. The problem is that they're not funded, not by us and not by others. So that's a problem. So they can't sustain the effort because it's financially in the America we live in, you got to live. People got wives, people got children. You got to have a financial stability. Our community, which is the same in the black community, we haven't realized this importance of supporting our institutions and financially and sustaining them so that the average imam in the black community works for free. The average imam in the white community or suburban communities is at a minimum of $50,000 a year with benefits. There's no comparison, right? The average black imam around the country in his masjid is doing it for free and using his own money to help sustain the masjid. The average imam in a white Muslim community, a immigrant Islamic community, at minimum is $50,000 with benefits. That's all he does. He's supported by a board who pays them. That's a whole nother discussion, but we're just talking about the reality. Where that imam is to the imam, the board, the plumber, the janitor, the roofer, everything. And he's not supported. So how is he gonna do the same? It's not feasible. So there, there, there's something gotta give. So what happens to the second part of the question, those qualified, quote unquote, is relative, qualifications are relative now, right? Keep that in mind, right? So that's relative. Uh, that qualified person, sheikh, scholar in the black community, now is forced. Either I'm going to suffer with my people and my family and my children going to suffer, or I'm going to go to this institution who's going to pay me 50, 60, 70, 80,000, give me a nice home, give me Hajj trips, Umrah trips, everything, or I'm going to stay in the community and suffer. That's his decision. And unfortunately, too many of our qualified people have taken the latter option instead of the former. Okay. And I can't blame them because at, I blame them, but everybody don't have this. You know what I mean? I say, when I say I can't blame them, I understand, but I still blame you. So man, suck it up, go work with your people and build. That's another discussion. But, okay. but so you understand my, my thing, but that could be solved. You know how that could be solved? Every single immigrant community, especially among the big three, they work with hundreds of thousands of dollars in zakat money. I ain't talking about 
operating money. I'm talking about zakat money, money that should go to the poor people. In Islam, we have definitions for poor. We have al-fuqara and we have al-masakin. You're aware of this, right? And the sadaqahs for this primarily, lil-fuqara, wal-masakin, and then the other six categories, right? In the Shafi'i school, so I, I can't speak about the other schools, I'm Shafi'i. In the Shafi'i school, the faqir is much, poor, much more poor than the miskin. That's why he's first. The faqir is the one who doesn't get half of what he needs to survive. So he needs $5, he can't even get 250. The miskin is the one who can get half or more, but not all what he needs. So he can get 250 or three, but he can't get the five. Our community are fukara. We don't even get half of what we need. Go in our communities, we are below or just at the level of the poverty line. That's real in the black communities and at the majority of us, right? So, and so the zakat money by its Islamic definition should go to them. And these are Muslims I'm talking about, especially the Muslim community because the Muslim blacks, unfortunately, with the exception of Imam Wafti Muhammad's community, are the poorest of the Muslims. We talk about economics. So when they get on the Sunnah, they get broke too. Don't forget that. They are the right. poorest. So they deserve the zakat money. What is the purpose of zakat money? The purpose of zakat money is to change the condition of the poor person. In fact, you give him the bulk of, they say if we got 10,000, in zakat, let me give you shari rulings. We got 10,000. And if we could give the majority of that money to someone to empower them to become a, a businessman, to build, we should give that money to that person so that he comes off the zakat list and he's able to pay zakat. You under, that's the purpose in the sharia. We're talking about not. See, when we don't know the Sharia, it's easy to start playing games with us. No, nah, no, nah, we know the sacred law. That's the right of the poor. You're taking the right of the poor and using it, which doesn't have priority. That's haram. That's not lawful. You are unjust because this is a priority and a need, and you're ignoring that need. Why do I know you need? You're doing it because the condition's the same and you do have the money. Right. So if you just took the zakat money and you put it, all of the zakat money goes into these poor Muslim communities in the black community, you would change the condition automatically. They could pay for their teachers. They could, because they would do that. The money goes to individuals. And those individuals become strong. And now those individuals are able to support their institutions because they do have money now. It's changed, right? Then the institution becomes strong and sustainable. Then the institution can pay their teachers. You've changed the situation. But if you keep all the zakat money to yourselves and say, you know, this is for us. What about your other fellow Muslims? It doesn't say a kind of Muslim. It says a Muslim and the poor among the Muslims. Your people ain't poor. All of y'all got a bunch of jobs and live in $100,000, $200,000, if not million dollar homes with college educations. You're not poor, they poor. Why is that money not going to them? They're not in our community. Is that what you're telling me? Oh, so you're saying we should join, but you tell us we're not a part of your community. Because we don't live in the suburbs. Aoudhu Billah. Talk to me. We're talking Quran. And we're talking yeah. Islam. We're talking justice. We're talking avoiding oppression. So tell me how that's not oppression. We said oppression is to take the rights and put them in their own, put them in their improper place. Right? Right. That's right. Brother Imam, uh, that, 
We're going to have to, this is going to have to be a continuation of I a told you this can go on and on if we're going to talk because yeah, you have to do something now. Now, yeah. listen, you know what we do in our communities and you're in the community, you know what we do? What I do is I meet with the government officials, right? And our local officials, the mayor, the police chief, the prosecutor, the sheriff. I meet with them in the masjid. I'm not coming to your office, no. You come to us where there is a, where the work needs to be done. I ain't making no appointment. You're the mayor, you're the chief of police, you're the, you're the sheriff, you're the prosecutor. You come in the hood, you come in the community, you sit with the people in the community. We're not coming to your office. You come and your job is to serve Service doesn't mean the one who's in need comes to you. The one who's in service goes to the people who are in need. Do you follow my point? Now, yeah. they're not used to that. Well, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. Now, when you're in the community, guess what? Firsthand, you see the pain. Firsthand, you see the need. Firsthand, you're dealing with people who are going to make you uncomfortable. Right? Because if you sit at your place of privilege, you can claim ignorance. You can claim ignorance. But if I put you in the hood, I put you with the poor and show you the conditions of Muslims that are in the inner cities, now you can't claim ignorance. You can't sit in your place of privilege and I'm not giving you that. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> now with that, we're gonna have to close out. Okay. But to speak to that, I'm, I want this conversation to continue. Although this is the end of this series, inshallah, myself and Tabari, we've been talking. We've talked with some of the table staff, Sheikh Rami them. We want to have a continuation of not just this conversation, but a, a much larger uh, conversation in general, a platform where we can start coming up with some more ideas and initiatives. Because like you said, it's time for some action. So within what you were talking about, some of the takeaways that I've got, Okay, we need to increase the educational opportunities for African American Muslims in particular, but within the Muslim community in general, but particularly speaking within the African American community, because this is where the greatest disparity lies, the greatest oppression lies there. So increase of uh, op educational opportunities. There also needs to be a outlet for the imams and the people to do out within the community, the teachers to have support and institutions to be supported, not only from the people within the community, but those who are without like you're talking about with the zakat funding, because we talked about this in another episode. The primary place where the zakat should go is here in this country. For people who spent, pay their zakat here in the United States, the primary place where the majority of your zakat money should be spent is here. Our brothers and sisters overseas, they're having a lot of issues, and it's true that we need to do our best to support them as we can. But first and foremost, the, the sadaqah, the zakat that's being spent, is being offered up, is supposed to go within the community that the money is coming from. So we need to make sure that the zakat and the sardica that's being given up to the institutions is being distributed equitably amongst the people here within this country before it leaves and goes overseas. And again, primarily the biggest uh, source of oppression and, and, and need is within the African-American community, speaking directly to the issues that we're talking about. And the third one is also making sure that we are supporting our imams, our teachers, and our massage it in all of the institutions and that we're actually working together to build them up and give them the resources whether it's financial or human capital that they need in order to be successful and train up the people that we need to continue the work that has been done over the years and to end that i would also say that we need to make sure that we are being much more reflective of not only the things that we are pleased with, with, with the things that are making us uncomfortable because where we find our discomfort is actually the places where we need to work on growing or changing. So those are the areas that we need to work on the most. And for those who have found a lot of discomfort with some of the things that were said, again, you need to go dig into yourself and ask yourself why are you uncomfortable with this? Because if it's true and you acknowledge the truthfulness of it, then if you're uncomfortable about it, then that may be something you need to change within yourself or within your community or your environment as a result of you being a witness to these things. So did I leave anything out? May Allah bless you. Jazakallah khairin ya imam. 
you know nas'alullah you know an 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 yu'tik al-'afiyah wa nas'alullah an 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 yaqbal kull a'malika as-salihat insha'allah Tabri, you have anything to add before we let the Imam close us out with du'a? No, 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 no. Tabri was huh? too quiet. He got to close us out. <laughs> I want the blessing of his du'a. <laughs> yeah, we have a rule. <laughs> when you come to someone's house, you, you allow them out of respect. This is your house. I'm invited. I need to <laughs> serve. I've helped. Now you give me the blessing of your du'a. Alhamdulillah. We appreciate you coming on as well, Imam. We really um, do. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, we ask that, uh, we ask Allah, Allahumma salli wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad and Nabi al-Ummi al-Ameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Um, Allahumma tahir kulubana min kulli wasfan yuba'iduna an mushahadatika wa muhabbatika. We ask you, Ya Allah, purify our hearts of every characteristic that keeps us far away from you and from witnessing you. Allahumma, Allahumma, we ask you, Allah, give us the best of this life, the best of the next life, and save us from the punishment of the fire. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yusufun. Wassalamu ala mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Inshallah, we will continue some conversations. So be on the lookout for some things. Make sure that you uh, check out Imam Amin's work with Masjid Muhammad and support him and what his efforts, is, uh, what he's doing with his community. Also, as always, we need your du'as here at Table Foundation, and we also need your support as well. So do whatever you can to share. So uh, encourage others to support us. Support us yourselves. Uh, just whatever can be done, we need it. As we already talked about, the work is crucial and it needs to be carried forward. Inshallah, we will see you on the next one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam.